Welcome to the Speak Like a Leader podcast with John Bates. Welcome to the show. With me today, we have someone that I've known for quite a while now, and uh, he's just a really great guy on top of being a super talented guy. And his name is John Livesey, the pitch whisperer. And if you want to find John online, you can find him at johnlivesey.com, J-O-H-N-L-I-V-E-S-A-Y.com. So John, welcome to Speak Like a Leader. Show. Thanks for Thanks coming. Thanks for having me, John. You're always so warm and welcoming to everybody. Well, thank you. You know, I try to only have people on here that I'd really like to be <laughs> welcoming to, but, uh, but I appreciate that, John. So listen, you, you, uh, you and I kind of do similar things, but from very different points of view, I think. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, you know, I, I wonder, let's start like, you know, I try to keep this evergreen, but yeah. it seems like, the COVID pandemic is evergreen as well. So I think that what is evergreen really jokes aside out of the pandemic is that we're going to be virtual has just taken a place that mm -hmm. is, you know, much bigger than it was. Yes. And I think it's interesting that we all kind of had to do it at the same time. And there was like, no, not figuring it out. Like everybody just had to figure it out. So in your world and in your, in what you're seeing, what are some of the key things that, you know, as we're 18 plus months in and as people are starting to really make real plans for how are we going to be a virtual company mm. for good? What are some of the things you're seeing from your point of view in the world of communication, particularly influence and sales and leadership and stuff? Well, I think there's a whole new framework now of how to attract and keep top talent as a leader. It's a really good point. There's a lot more. more flexibility around. Um, you don't have to be in the office every day, which has freed up a lot of people to think, oh, I could live somewhere that's less expensive than in this yeah. urban dense area. Yeah. Um, and also the need to be good on camera has doubled. Yes. Or because, tripled or quadrupled or like, I mean, you know, yeah. we always knew we wanted these face to face meetings, especially when you're trying to get someone to hire you or buy from you. And so now that has translated to being on camera and boy, if you're not comfortable being on camera or feel nervous or don't have good lighting, I mean, there's 101 mistakes you could make. Yes. Which is your, um, one of your many areas of expertise. It really becomes a problem. I've had companies say to me, in addition to teaching our sales team how to become better storytellers, can you also help them be confident on camera when they're telling those stories? So yes. it's opened up a new area of opportunity that it's not enough just to give somebody good content, that there is some need for some delivery skills. And that's why I always love to collaborate with you because that really is your um, strength. Um, the, oh, other thank big, you, John. the other big thing I think I really see is as, as important it is to look and sound good on camera not that we all have to be Brad Pitt or, you know, uh, yeah, no, Aniston, I'm nowhere near across, um, likable and look at the camera and all those little things that you take for granted. Uh, because if you've ever been on a call where someone is not well lit or looking down instead of looking up or you're like, I can't see your eyes. And we don't realize how important seeing someone's eyes are to build trust. Yes. Um, but I would, my whole premise also now is storytelling is more important than ever. I totally agree, John. Couldn't agree more. Because even when you're in face-to-face -face meetings, you know, you come in, you give your presentation, hire me, buy from me, whatever it is. Um, during my team, you're selling something. A lot of what you say is not memorable. Mm. Like if, especially if you're pushing out facts and figures. We've been in business this many years. You'll make this much money if you come work here, blah, blah, blah. Or this product will make your whatever do 30% faster. Um, but... You put that on camera and it's even less memorable. And the joy of storytelling is we are wired for stories. And so if you tell a good story, it really helps you become memorable because if it's a really good story, people are going to remember it enough to share it. Yes. You know, John, that's a thing that I've just started saying recently because I, 
I run into so many people who like kind of I was before <laughs> they like, I kind of thought, Oh, like, you know, I have to have a new story every time. Right. I couldn't be further from the truth, man. Have one really good story for the new person that you meet every time, like yeah. much easier to find a new audience than it is right. to create a new story. Right. And, and, but I realized stories are like songs mm. and think of how many times I've listened to satisfaction. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and so even if you have your team there with you and you're meeting a new client, go ahead and tell that story. Everybody on your team has heard a hundred times because mm -hmm. they think it's a good story because you've told it a hundred times and you've perfected it. And yeah. that's the best story that you have to share with this new client. So do it. I couldn't agree more. This being known for one thing. And in the speaking world, it's interesting. I've, Listen to a lot of speakers who have what we call signature stories. Yes. You know, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Or one or two really great stories. And if they get hired back, you know, you and I have both been asked back many times. Yeah. NASA's had you back many times. Um, I've had some companies invite me back and it's very flattering, but the tendency is, Ooh, I got to come with all new material. Right. And I've heard this from a lot of speakers that if you don't give your signature story, people will come up to you going, gosh, I, I was so looking forward to hearing yeah. that. Or I heard about this story and I, I was really wanting to hear your, you give it. Yeah. My friends all told me about this story. I wanted to hear you tell it, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like the stone's not playing satisfaction. Yes. I tell people that the key to really being successful with storytelling as a sales tool is to think of your brain like a jukebox or if you're younger, like a playlist. Yeah. <laughs> <Some people don't. laughs> Very good. Well, but they yeah. know one of the two. And, um, you know, you push a letter and a number in a jukebox and a song comes out, the same thing with the playlist. Yeah. Um, you customize it. And that really is where you get to the black belt in storytelling. I totally you agree. have more than one story ready to go. Because a lot of companies and people have two or three avatars, right? Let's say you're selling, I don't know, insurance. And you're like, well, I have one insurance plan for a new young family. And then I've got another insurance plan for someone who's getting ready to retire. Yeah. And so you want to have a customized story that fits them because when you tell a story that people see themselves in the story, that's when the magic happens. Bingo. Yeah. You know, John, it's interesting because I was just talking with Matthew Pollard on uh, an yeah. earlier yes. podcast. Do you know who he is? I've had him on my podcast. He's fantastic. Yeah. He's fantastic. And this is one of the things that he says that I think extroverts could get a lot out of, even though Matthew's audience is introverts, right? Mm -hmm. He says, have a plan for these things, yes. you know, go ahead and practice your stories because that makes introverts feel much more comfortable if they know what they're doing. Right. Well, even if you're a really great on your feet, like quick on your feet, extrovert, it's really a good idea to have a plan and think about yeah. some stories and really target them at that audience that, you know, you're going to be speaking to soon. You know, so uh, yeah, I think all of us are saying the same thing to people, you know. Well, there's a classic example. So many people are afraid to niche on one thing. Yeah. But the fact you said Matthew Pollard, I go, oh, the introvert expert. Yeah, oh. exactly. And yep. you think, oh, well, then he's really limiting himself. No. No. Extroverts <laughs> hire him and listen by his books and hire him to speak to their whole audience. Yeah. Um, and the other thing you were saying that I thought was so fascinating is so many people don't want to be prepared. And I'm all just wing it. Yeah. I, yeah. Um, like on an elevator pitch. Yeah. We are going to get asked who knows how many more times in our life. Tell me about yourself. What do you do? Yep. Yep. You know, and that's your invitation to give some form of the traditional elevator pitch, yeah. which I say, make it an elevator story. Yeah. So John, tell us your mm -hmm. elevator story. <laughs> well, it's all about, you knowing how so many people feel like they're drowning in a sea of sameness. Yeah. Whether they're a coach, there's tons of coaches, or whether they're selling financial advisor services, and they struggle not to be seen as this commodity. So I'm the pitch whisperer, and I teach them how to tell a story that makes them memorable and irresistible, and after they tell stories, their business takes off. Isn't it funny how that works? Hmm. So my whole premise of that elevator story is planting certain seeds in there that intrigue people to ask a question. My definition of a good elevator story is, You've intrigued someone enough to go, well, Mr. Bates, that's interesting. Tell me more. 
really great. That's a really great thing. To, that's I like that. I'm like, I know what a dog whisperer is. I even know what a horse whisperer is. What the heck is a pitch whisperer? It doesn't yeah. matter what they ask me from that. Yeah. It, if there's little seeds in there to intrigue someone to ask me something. That yes. was a conversation. And they go, stories help you sell better? Tell me more yeah. about how I've never thought of that. What does that mean? Yeah. Doesn't, it doesn't matter what the question is. Yeah. They're intrigued enough to want to know more. Well, you know, John, when I'm working with people on their TED-like talks, I tell people the opening of your talk is the most important part. And some people will push back and say, oh, but wait, what about the content? I mean, the content's what's really important. I'm like, well, listen, if you lose them in the opening, the content doesn't <laughs> even have a chance, right? right. So this is, this is the thing that you're saying, I think, with your, with your uh, pitch story, right? Yes. Like that first thing they hear from you, uh -huh. all it really needs to do is intrigue them. And grab them. Uh, you yeah. know, I have an advertising background. And so it was hammered into us. If it's a print yeah. ad, what's the headline? If yeah. it's a TV commercial, if it's an opening to a James Bond movie, we know that opening has to pull us in before we even know yes. what the plot is. Yes. Uh, and what's funny is really good communicators like you take us on a journey in multiple platforms. I've seen it also with Elizabeth Gilbert, you know, the mm. author of Eat, Pray, Love. Mm. I heard her yeah. speak about her book, Big Magic. And she yeah. told, you know, she told this great story and then I bought the book and then I'm reading the story that's in the book. Yeah. And I do the same thing. The opening to my TEDx talk is a yes. story of how I saved a little girl when I was a lifeguard and lessons I learned from that. Yeah. It's the opening to my book. It's the opening to my keynotes. Yep. And every once in a while, someone will say, oh, I, I heard that or I read that. And I go, yes, it's called branding. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. It's the, well, and you know, and I think it's important to, to, so first of all, I'm like, okay, I want to hear the story about how you saved the little girl, uh -huh. but, but uh, so, so please tell us in a second, but the thing yeah. that you just said that I think is so important for people to remember is that, you know, I'll say it this way. When I had my company, bigwords.com back in the dot com days, mm -hmm. we, we wanted to change our branding kind of stuff, you know, about six months in, <laughs> you know, we're like, Oh, we can make it better. And, uh, and the guy that I had hired to be my boss, who's going to be on the podcast pretty soon, his name's RB Hackenberg. And he worked at uh shy day mm -hmm. has been just an absolute leader in the direct advertising field yeah. forever. He said, boys, no one even knows our brand yet. Like mm -hmm. we can't change our brand, you know, and, and I'd never really thought about it that way. And I think it's the same thing with your, with what you said about your story. You tell that story in every possible yes. medium at every possible opportunity. And the people that have already heard it are like, yeah, I love that story. Mm -hmm. And the people who haven't are like, wow, that's a great story. No, nobody ever goes, oh, he tells that story all the time. I mean, mm -hmm. maybe one or two of them do, but you know, they're probably not your client anyway. Exactly. Uh, yeah, I used to call on Shy at Day when I lived in Los Angeles. And for uh -huh. those, no, they had huge clients like Apple. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. So we, yeah, Nissan. You know, and about. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so tell us that story, will you? Sure. Well, picture this. I'm 19 years old, sitting on my lifeguard stand in the suburbs of Chicago on this hot summer night day. And I've got zinc oxide on my nose and a whistle around my neck and mirror sunglasses, feeling like I'm really cool. <laughs> but the majority of my time was just blowing my whistle at kids, telling them not to run on wet cement. Except this one day, I saw this 10-year-old girl standing on the edge of the diving board, the high dive, with a lot of trepidation, looking down and taking a lot longer than kids normally did to jump off. And I went, oh boy, it's probably her first time. And so that alone made me sit up on the edge of my perch. And when she finally found the courage to jump off, she was underwater and I start counting how many seconds, three seconds, four seconds, five seconds. And I thought, oh my God, she's underwater two seconds too long. And I see her flailing. So I can't even throw her a, a life board. So I had to jump in and I pulled her to the side and she was coughing and choking, but I knew she was going to be okay. Now, while that event happened decades ago, the lesson I've learned to not panic and stay calm when 
something stressful happens has served me my entire career. And that's why we have to be the lifeguard of our own life. Yeah. That's awesome. That's, that's cool. So yeah, I love it. And, and now people will always remember you because you've been generous enough. I say Mm -hmm. to give us a meaningful touch point on who you are. So when we look at you, we're, we can't help but picture, oh, the 19-year-old version with zinc oxide and the cool mirrored sunglasses, and right? And he was on top of it enough to pay attention and rescue that girl. And, and you know, that is really important to us. And I think that it goes directly to what you're talking about all the time, which is how do you have yourself stand out in this sea of sameness, right? Mm -hmm. Like think of how many people there are named John. (laughs) There's two of them right here, right? That's not helping us. But when you're generous enough and willing to give people some sort of an insight into you, you become the lifeguard guy, right? Okay. So you've just become the lifeguard guy and maybe that's not your entire personality. You don't want to be the, def- no, but you've now they've got an in with you, right? They can come tell you some related story, right? Like I was a lifeguard too, or, hmm. uh, you know, wow, I got saved once or any of those other things. Or I had a situation where I didn't panic and I stayed calm because I Perf- had yeah. training, whatever it is. Yeah. And all that stuff. Right. And I just think that, that I think that that is a very generous thing to do because it's a little bit scary, you know, Hmm. to, to put yourself out there like that. And yeah, well, you know, it's our vulnerability is where we get connection with people. Yes. And, you know, the traditional lifeguard training is something called reach, throw, row, toe, go. The last thing you do is jump in. Yeah. So because of that training, I do a very short description in the story of she was panicking too much for me to throw her something. Yes. Yes. I caught that. Some people going, why yeah. didn't you follow the rules? Right. <laughs> uh huh. Um, and then I think every good story has to have a resolution. And this is where your expertise is, right? What is the takeaway? It's, it's nice. That's a nice story. You save somebody, but unless I tie it into what it means to you. Yeah. That, Oh, I might want to look at times when, and now more than ever, this concept of embracing disruption. Boy, oh boy. And not panicking when we hear bad news or get bad news or how we have to, you know, rescue ourselves. Uh, that there's you know, that, uh, that all, that whole thing is the opening becomes an echo throughout the whole talk where I talk yes. about your examples of staying calm and not panicking and then how yeah. that led to another thing. And so that lays the foundation as a good, so a story lays the foundation for other stories and then really sophisticated storytellers like you and I can tie it back to the beginning. Yeah. You see that with stand-up comics. They'll say yes. something funny at the beginning and then they tie it all back and you're like, oh, that whole yeah. thing has a bow on it now. Yeah. It's really powerful. It's super duper powerful. But that requires preparation. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Quite a bit. Quite a bit of preparation. Yeah. And I, and. You know, uh, to set that up and then to be able to call back to it, you're you're illustrating something that's one of my favorite quotes around storytelling, which is from Les Brown. He said, never tell a story without a point, which Mm -hmm. I totally agree with, and never make a point without a story. (laughs) Nice. Right? So every time people want to make a point, the number one thing I think they could do is look for a story in their own lives that yep. illustrate that point. Now, what do you say, John, to the people that you must have met, like I do, who say, well, you know, you've got all these exciting things going on. Uh, you know, uh, you go all over, you do all this stuff. You're a keynote right. speaker, right? You're, you're, you've got exciting stories. I don't have any mm. stories. It's a very common question. And yep. Something I address that everyone has a story. And so once I start asking some questions to uncover them, Mm-hmm. Such as you've never made a mistake in your whole life. <laughs> yeah. oh, That's well, a great place to start right yeah, there. They go, oh, you've never had a bad holiday meal with your family. You know, that's right for, you know, the Thanksgiving yeah. that went wrong. Right. Yeah. Um, I actually did a whole press segment on don't go cold Turkey into your family Thanksgiving. You know, <laughs> you know, you're going to get asked questions like when yeah. you get married or all the yeah. hot buttons that people. Yeah. Play. 
Um, the Do other, a little preparation for that. Yes. Uh, the other place is, you know, you've, you've never been on any trip. You've never taken a road trip. You've never taken an airplane trip. Yeah. You, you've never been out of your um, home because yeah. road trips, delayed flights, all those things that we can learn from and make choices of. Do I act stressed out or kind? You've never been in a car accident. Um, you've never lost anybody. You've never almost had a, you know, uh, if you're a certain age, you, you know, have some loss in your life typically. So um, you just fell into this career. You never had a dream of doing something. Um, all, the, so the, all those start to get yeah. me, is mine going, oh, maybe I do have a story or two. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And you know what you're illustrating beautifully with that, John, is something that I always think about. Because a lot, one thing I get asked, and you probably get asked this a lot too, is, John, you know, like I want to be, I want to connect with my audience, you mm -hmm. know? And when people say that to me, I, I say, can I tease you for a minute? And they're like, okay. And I say, well, you've already made one false assumption there. Do you, and they're like, what, what do you, what do you mean? I say, well, when you say I want to connect with my audience, you're assuming that you're not already connected. Mm -hmm. And as you just really beautifully pointed out, John, we're human beings. Like we all, like we're way more alike and have way more in common than we ever mm -hmm. don't, you know, yeah. and anything that touched you as a human being made right. a difference for you as a human being that you still even remember. I mean, how old are we, right? Anything you and I still remember, that was a big deal because we still remember it exactly. and it would therefore matter to someone else. Well, a lot of times people will say, you know, I, I don't think I'm a good speaker because I'm not funny or maybe I should open my presentations with a joke or something. Yeah. Like, listen, unless you're a professional comedian, I don't really recommend that. Yeah, don't do that. However, right. If you say something and you find that it amuses someone, there might be some gold there. I find I'm my funniest when I'm not trying to be funny. Uh, yes, totally I, agree. I was working on a point and um, about what I wanted to make in a talk. And I said, you know, I've done some research and it shows that if you take a cold shower, it burns fat, fights depression and reduces inflammation. It had me, it burns fat. <laughs> right that's and right i said that to somebody and he yeah. laughed like you did and i thought huh i wonder if everybody would find that funny let me try that in front of the live audience right yeah and yeah. i got a laugh and then i was talking to a friend of mine who's a specialist in humor and he goes in comedy we have this thing where we say if this is true what else is true i said oh what do you mean he goes well in your case we would say in fact, I stopped working out altogether and I just take cold showers three times a day. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. And there so we go. Very fun. Comics do that where they get one laugh yeah. and then they take it to the next level and get another laugh because in that world of, well, if taking cold showers, yeah. burns fat, then what would be, what else could be yeah. funny in that world? Yeah. Forget I, working out. I'm just taking is, cold showers three times well, a day. You know, yeah. stories have structure, even things that have humor have structure. Yes. And he said, you know, we would test this. In a comedy, you're like, which makes it funnier? Saying burns fat first, second, or third? Yeah. So everything like an ad gets tested. Yeah. Um, and most people don't realize the, the skill and the technique and the practice to see what is funniest. Yeah. And based on the order of that. And um, turns I, I tested it and, you know, it turns out saying burns fat first. Yeah. Is a bigger payoff, especially to, it had me at burns fat. I didn't have to. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, but the, I think those little taking people behind the curtain a little bit today, oh, way big deal. Yes. Is, is helpful for people to realize, Oh, it's a skill I can learn. I can learn. Maybe I'm never going to be a, an opera singer, but I can learn how to be a better singer, um, yeah. or carry a tune or learn a little bit of playing the piano. I'm never going to be yeah. a part of all. Same thing is true about storytelling. Yes. Even if you think you're good, you can always get at a black belt level. Always, and, always get mm -hmm. better. And if you're not good, it doesn't mean, look, I, genetically, we all have it built in. Mm -hmm. Our ancestors were good at this. It's so important that if they weren't good at it, they would have been plucked out of the gene pool and we wouldn't even <laughs> be here, you yeah. know? So we all have it built in. It just takes a little bit of attention, I think. And awareness, how important it is. Yeah, yeah I mean, th which is key because yeah. that's, I think, <laughs> that's where it first goes wrong is people think, oh, it's, it's fluffy. It's not, it's not really important. It's, you know, oh, storytelling, like. Let me give you facts and figures to try and convince you of something when in fact people buy emotionally 
and yes. back it up with logic. If you're going into a Lamborghini dealer, they're not talking about miles per gallon. No. no. <laughs> they're talking no. about how fun it's going to be, how sexy you're going to feel, all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And they might justify it with a few things like nobody else has this color of paint or whatever, but mm -hmm. like it's, yeah, the, it's, you're totally right. Yeah. So it brings up what I talk about a lot. Yes, yes, yes. No. Right. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Is logic. Okay. No, that final no means we didn't make the emotional connection right. and stories are one of the most direct routes to emotional connection. I have what I call the three C's of any story. Mm as a checklist for everybody. Is it clear? Because man, if you confuse people with acronyms, <laughs> no. they're, 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 everyone, you're confused. You're never going to tell anybody you're confused. You're just going to say no. Yeah. Is it concise? And this is where people really struggle. Oh, I need 20 minutes to explain something. You know, Einstein said, if you can't explain it simply, you don't know it well enough. Yeah, that's for sure. And then finally is compelling. Mm. And that's the emotional tug at the hard strings to get people to open the purse strings. Yes. So using words like struggle, when you describe someone's problem, they're struggling mm. with, um, then people start to have empathy for that. Uh -huh. Yeah. So clear, concise, and compelling as a checklist helps a lot of people go, oh, now at least I have some structure. Maybe I only have two of the three. Yeah. I didn't know I needed the third or whatever it is. Right. Or it's how very good, it John. Precise. So, yeah. That's very, very good. That's very good. You know, one of the ways that I help people dial down on that, and I think it would be interesting to hear your thoughts on this. So, so that's why I'm bringing it up is um, I feel like when people finally make the decision to tell some stories, mm -hmm. there's still a lot of resistance because it's a little scary. You know, it's like, it's putting yourself out there and People right. might not, it might not work or they might laugh at you or who knows what we're afraid of. But I think as human beings, we're just afraid of that. Right. I mean, look what happens to people get noticed by the group, you know, right. Jesus, Joan of Arc, Martin Luther King, John F. Kennedy. Yeah, the tall you know. syndrome. Yes. And so exactly right. So it is a little scary, but when people make that first step into storytelling, I think what I see next is what I call the book report syndrome, <laughs> right? They're, given us this esoteric held at arm's length kind of book report about right. the thing that happened yes. versus really being close to it themselves and bringing us into it like a journey. And yes. I think that your three C's can really help with that. Yes. And I'll, I'll share another story and another tip after the story that really helps people with that. So when I was selling advertising a few years ago, uh, for a fashion magazine owned by Condé Nast in LA, Speedo was in my territory. Uh -huh. And I went to them and I said, oh, I see you have you know, a line of sportswear coming out. Would you consider advertising that in my fashion magazine? And they said, no, we're going to run it in a fitness magazine. And I said, well, what if we treated the sportswear like it was fashion and had the models wearing sportswear around a hotel swimming pool? And Michael Phelps is on your payroll during the Olympics and have him show up. I bet we get a lot of press and that would yeah. drive a lot of sales. And they liked the idea well enough that they gave me the advertising. And for me, That's it's a more good life. idea, John. Yeah. Thanks. I got to meet Michael Phelps. <laughs> That's cool. So I went up to him and, you know, I've got a picture of me with him and uh, we were both younger, of course. And uh, <laughs> I said, Michael, everyone says you're so successful because your feet are like fins and your lungs are much bigger than the average person, but I'm guessing there's something else. And he goes, Oh yes, John. When I was younger, uh, my coach said to me, Michael, are you willing to work out on Sundays? Yes, coach. Great. We just got 52 more workouts than the rest of the competition. Wow. And now wow. everyone can think about, well, what can I do that the competition isn't willing to do to get up to the Olympic level and whatever my career is. Yeah. So that's another one of my signature stories. And I pull people into it as you were saying, take them on that journey versus saying the book report version of that would be, I sold some ads to Speedo. I met Michael Phelps and he told me he worked out on Sunday. Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. But I, I gave the dialogue in present tense. Yes. As, and I changed my voice slightly. Mm -hmm. And in person, I, you know, look up and look down and act yeah. out Michael in the pool, Michael looking up to his coach, um, yeah. all of those little nuances of if you're going to recreate dialogue put it in present tense as if someone's eavesdropping in on what's being said yes the story 
Which is absolutely key because we cannot help but be there when you're telling it in present tense. Mm. Right. It's like that old thing of like, don't imagine a purple elephant dancing on your desk right now. A little cute little purple elephant. Don't imagine it. Right. Right. (laughs) We, We can't not imagine it. Right. And then again, what I do for the audience is say, so what does that mean to you? What's your takeaway? Oh, Great. start thinking about what you're willing to do that competition isn't. Yeah. And then they go, oh my gosh, that starts my whole brain working. That's a great takeaway now for yeah. us, you know, if we want to be at that Olympic level. Yes. Uh, without having to be, you know, um, an athlete. So it's up to us as storytellers to give that resolution, that takeaway to our stories to make them meaningful. Absolutely. Yeah. Otherwise it's just wasted breath, I think. Mm-hmm. And the other thing I notice is that now knowing your zinc oxide story, yeah. you know, meeting Michael Phelps. Okay. Yeah. That means even more to John Livesey than it might mean to someone else. So yeah. I'm starting to get this. And you know what I think is really interesting and can be very useful and look, it can go wrong and, and all that, I admit it, but I don't think that's this is that people will start filling in all kinds of details and a Mm -hmm. lot of those details they'll even be right about, you Mm -hmm. know, but when you give people this structure and framework to see you through and you make it easy for them to kind of in a way pigeonhole you, right. You're the, Oh, the, the, you know, the zinc oxide guy, you know, the, the, right. The, the lifeguard guy. Well, it, it just makes it so much easier for people, right? And they when they know a few points to triangulate from, yes. they can really figure out a whole bunch about where you're coming from and who you are. And that allows them to see ways that they can align and find a place for themselves inside your world. And that sounds like people might say, well, who am I to do that? Like, why do people, you know? Well, I, it's just nice and generous because people mm-hmm. actually appreciate it. It's yeah. you making yourself available to them in a way that just, I don't think most people do right off the bat. Well, that's why when I work with sales teams that have to go in and present against competitors, I used to have to do it. Uh-huh. You know, like, let's say we're looking at uh, 10 magazines. We're going to pick three and you each get to come in yeah. for half an hour back to back. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think the piece most people forget is their own story of origin. It's the what absolute made- key. What made you get into this business? What made you get into being an architect, being in advertising? Why do you love fashion? Whatever it is. Yep. And then they lock into you. Oh, this isn't just a job. You're not a robot pitching me something. Right. Right. And think about it. If you're the one guy out of those 10 magazines, the one, if you're the one person that's presenting out of all 10 of those who actually tells them where you're coming from like that. Mm -hmm. Oh, hello. The other nine are just kind of noise, you know? Exactly. And all of a sudden you're the one who stands out. And, and I do think that there is an element of kind of what I would call false modesty that people need to get over to be able to do that. Mm. But to understand that that is not being selfish. That's actually, I believe being very, very generous with yourself to share that origin and why you care yeah. in a way that lets them know that they can trust you around this and where you're coming from. Cause that's important to them at that moment. If they're considering buying from you or following you or listening to you or, you know, doing something with you. Mm-hmm. It, I remember um, when I was working for the fashion magazine W and the publisher would tell me, you know, sometimes she would go to New York fashion week or in Italy and have to see multiple designers back to back. And she would wear that designer's clothes for that sales call and then change in the cab or wherever and change them from Gucci to whatever. Oh, have, that's smart. Yeah. Because you want to be wearing their, whatever their yeah. brand is when you go see yes. them. And so obviously you have a story of what it was like to buy that and why you pick this. Yeah. That. And, yep. um, and you know, you'd be surprised how they love hearing that on the ground journey of yeah. what your process was. Um, cause it's, you know, much better than just raw data. Yeah, absolutely. You know, of these jackets as opposed to a story of here's why I picked this jacket. Yeah, totally. And why I think, you know, the hundreds of thousands of readers will pick it. <laughs> yeah. Right. Hmm. So wh- who were some of your influences, John, where did you get all this good stuff? I would say one of my early influences was Tim Sanders. 
Oh, I love Tim Sanders. Dude, yeah. I met Tim Sanders ages ago. I met him about 17 years ago. Yeah, I think it was, I might have met him about the same time. He had just come out with his book, How love. to Be a Love Cat, I guess. Uh, love is the Killer App. Yep. Love is the Killer App. Yeah. And um, I loved his title, a Yahoo Chief Solutions Officer. Yes, that was cool. Thought, oh, someone can be in corporate America and write a book. That's what inspired me to write my first book that many years ago when I was still in corporate America. Uh -huh. And he talked about readers or leaders and how important it is to read and sum up a book and share that summary with people. So maybe they don't have to read it, but they yeah. would learn something. Yeah. And, um, so I summed up a book um, to him that I had read uh, and we started an email correspondence. And little did I know, years later, that would you know lead to me getting to hear him speak live and then him giving me tips on my speaking career. And you end up writing the forward to my book. So um, that, that's been a big influence. That is fabulous. That is fabulous. Are you still in touch with him? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Is he doing all right and everything's oh, good? Great. Of course, yeah. yeah. He, um, he's always got his pulse on the zeitgeist, even if it's subconscious. Right? Yeah. He had been, he'd been given a, a talk to Upwork. Uh -huh. and they, they loved him so much, they offered him a job and gave him the freedom to still speak. Wow. Okay. And of course, now he's got a steady income because he's not <laughs> trying to yeah. <laughs> full time. Um, so yeah, he's doing great. Oh, that's cool. So he's at Upwork. I'm going to go find him. That's, that's awesome. So, and what was one of your big takeaways from him? What would you say was one of the really big? Treat, um, you don't give any talk unless you're there to change a life in some way, even if it's just one person. Fabulous. Yeah. It should have an impact. Yeah. Oh, that's really good. So that, so that, um, so that core of you being there to make a difference has been there for a long time, John. Yeah, I mean, yes. Yeah. That's really cool. Well, so listen, what, what, uh, thinking of all the people that are hearing you now that maybe have never heard you before, <laughs> what's one or two of the things that you think, are really important for them to know that they just haven't had a chance to hear from you yet. And then I'll, I'll let you go. I know we're getting close to the top of the hour here. I would say the first thing is everyone has a story in them and don't try to go it alone. Mm. The fear of the unknown can stop us from trying new things. And so my solution yeah. to that is don't go it alone. Work with people who can help you get better at whatever the topic is. Yeah. You're in management at a company, your team is going to have so much more engagement and loyalty if you invest in their career. Yes. Which gives them new skills separate from just doing their job better. And that's yeah. one of the reasons that storytelling is so powerful. I've had people say, this is helping me in my personal life. Oh, yeah. So I think that's one of the things I'd love for people to know. And ultimately, my big passion is helping as many people as possible get off what I call the self-esteem roller coaster. Cause I was on it. I only yeah. felt good if my numbers were up and I felt bad if my numbers were down. Mm. And I think we all have to zoom out and remember that who we are is bigger than what we do. Oh, brilliant. I love it. I love it. I love it. That's awesome. So um, thank you very much for joining us today. I really, uh, really appreciate it. Thanks for all the, you know, the three C's and all the other great wisdom bombs that you dropped. And, uh, and and thank you for taking Tim on all those years ago and really making sure that every time you show up, you're there to make a difference. Because yeah. I know that you have, uh, uh -huh. you know, for a long time here. And and uh, and I I I love your work and I think you do great stuff and and I appreciate you sharing it with us. My pleasure, John. I I love being associated with people like you and Tim Sanders. It lifts us all up together. Yeah, boy. Amen. Glad to be a part of that group. So, uh, and for those of you that are listening, um, I just want to share with you that I do have uh, something. If you're interested in storytelling, you can certainly find John at johnlivesay.com, John the Pitch Whisperer. And if you're interested in doing a TED-like talk, which incorporates a lot of these pieces, go to Ed dot executive speaking success.com and check out the speak like a leader experience. It's an eight person cohort based course that goes over 10 weeks 
where we dig into your origin story, which John and I both agree is one of the most important stories you could ever get clear on. And then over those 10 weeks, you'll create a, your own TED-like talk that'll be useful to you anywhere, in sales, in conversation, in your personal life, in your professional life. Uh, so that's it, ed.executivespeakingsuccess.com, ed like education. So John, uh, anything else you want to say just in closing? One of my favorite quotes is Arthur Ashe, the famous tennis pro. The key to success is confidence and the key to confidence is preparation. Brilliant. Brilliant. Yes, there's definitely been a theme, not, not just in our conversation, but in kind of the the last couple of conversations here on speaklikeleader.show. That preparation is absolutely key. Absolutely key. And uh, thank you very much for sharing everything with us today, John. We'll, we'll have to do this again, huh? Uh, indeed. Thanks, John. Okay. And to those of you listening, thank you for joining us. We'll see you next week on speaklikeleader.show. Thank you for joining the Speak Like a Leader podcast. Go be awesome.